All right, thank you everyone for joining our panel tonight or today, depending on where you are. Um, this is a panel speaking about uh, engaging uh, students and early career professionals in scholarly communications and the impacts and successes from that in the future. Um, we have uh, a range of panelists today joining from all around the world. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from our panelists and then we will have a panel discussion where all of you as participants as well can join the discussion. Um, so FORCE 2021 is a conference, is the annual conference for FORCE 11, the future of research communications and e-scholarship. Uh, FORCE 11 is a community of enthusiastic, you know, publishers, librarians, scientists, and scholars, where all of them come together to work on common, uh, common topics of interest. Uh, you can join FORCE 11, FORCE 11 as a member for free. For more information about FORCE 11 or joining, um, just make sure to go to force11.org and then from there you can you can join uh, force 11 as a member uh, first 2021 is is uh, is a community effort so we had multiple collaborations with different organizations and also shout out to our sponsors who made sure that this conference is as accessible and diverse as possible and registration remains free so thanks to all of our collaborative collaborating organizations and sponsors uh, all sessions are going to be recorded and are going to be available right after the conference. So we will email you the, the direct links for all of the recorded sessions. Uh, we also uh, expect all of our attendees and, and panelists as well to adhere to our code of conduct. Uh, go to force11.org slash code of conduct so you can see the code of conduct. Um, for any information, for more help, please make sure to contact all the organizers in me and other session panelists through Slack or email us. Uh, we will start today's uh, panel with uh, our first speaker, Adriana. Adriana is a medical student from uh, from the uh, from Indonesia. Uh, please start introducing yourself, Adriana, and then talk uh, talk to us a little bit more about this topic today. Thank you very much, Osman, and for Force Eleven for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Adriana Miranda. I'm from University of Indonesia. I'm currently a final year medical student. And um, I've been working with Prof. Don and the Global Health Focus uh, in uh, working for publications, uh, especially about, of course, global health. And um, well, it's been a journey for me uh, because at first I didn't really know the importance of um, having a research publication early in my career. but then um, I realized that when I see that people all over the world, especially medical students from all over the world in global health focus are uh, publishing already, I started to think that maybe I need to also take part in, um, in publishing some articles, of course, um, within my own um, capacity. So that's when I started to uh, reach out to Professor Don Prisno um, to, um, to learn from him on how to uh, also be involved in this uh, initiative and to also publish with Google Health Focus. And uh, I'm so glad that now I've published several commentaries as well as research projects, um, both under the Global Health Focus and also um, on other projects. Uh, thank you very much, Adriana. Um, our next uh, panelist is Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf, would you like to introduce yourself and then um, you can mute, you can unmute yourself now. Uh, you're muted, Yusuf. Oh, sorry. So, hello, everyone. I'm super excited to be here this afternoon, this evening, this morning, and you get uh, you are in the world. So, uh, my name is Yusuf Adebayo Adebisi. I'm the director for research at Global Health Focus. So, basically, what we do at Global Health Focus is to uh, build critical thinkers and leaders in global health. And um, we strongly believe that science uh, research is really very important to um, 
to push forward evidence, especially when it comes to Africa, other resource limited settings. So getting the evidence from the uh, grassroots is really very important to uh, push for public understanding. And we strongly believe that young people are very crucial to actually uh, do this. So we equip them with knowledge, we equip them with skills, and we also provide mentorship to them so that they will be capable, they will be capable of, uh, um, of doing independent research and also uh, work on their own initiative to improve public understanding in any areas they are interested in. So uh, like Adela said, it's also one of our, our graduates and students that has been publishing with us. So as GHF, that's what we do. We build critical thinkers and leaders in global health by way of research, advocacy, and leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Our next speaker is Madalena. Madalena, you can introduce yourself and speak. Thank you very much, Osman, and thank you everyone for offering me the opportunity to speak here today. So my name is Madalina Elena Mandake, but I usually go by Nadi because that's sometimes easier for people because I have those letters from my alphabet. I'm a fifth year medical student from Craiova, Romania, actually, and I am here today to represent the IFMSA, the International Federation of Medical Students Association. So I will just uh, share my screen for a bit because I prepared, um, let's say, the, just a brief overview of our of our work so uh, everyone can just let me know if you can see my slides is it all right you can see my slides. we do Okay, thank you very much. So as I said, my name is Maddie. So I'm the liaison officer for medical education issues uh, on IFMSA. So what IFMSA is, we are one of the biggest student-led um, medical student associations in the world. We were actually founded in 1951, so quite a bit long time ago. And we are this big platform that goes and searches for uh, opportunities to offer for the future physicians, so for the medical students, and we actually represent at this current uh, point in time 1.3 million medical students worldwide. So we have national member organizations, uh, more than 130, and they all represent, as you can see on the map, over 120 countries, and that for us uh, is very amazing that we managed to uh, get here. So. IFMSA, as you can see, envisions a world in which medical students unite for global health and are equipped with the knowledge, skills, and values to take on the health leadership roles, both locally, but also globally. So we have work, we are working actually in many areas, as you can see. Of course, I'm here uh, today on behalf of the Research Exchange Standing Committee, but as you can see, we can also work on professional exchanges, public health, human rights and peace, medical education, and sexual and reproductive health and rights, including uh, HIV and AIDS. So we branch in very different areas, but of course, I'm here today to talk about the Standing Committee on Research Exchange and what we uh, mainly do in the domain of research. So the Standing Committee was created in uh, 1991 under a different name and adopted this name in 1998, which is fun fact also the year I was born in. So what this standing committee actually offers is for uh, the opportunity for medical students to uh, go and participate in a foreign research project between four to eight weeks. And we have over 2,500 SCORI students that participate every year in this foreign research exchange because we have more than 3,000 research projects they can actually choose from. So as you can see, even though we are 120 national member organization, we are working on getting all of them involved and active in research because at the current moment, all 80, uh, 84 actually NMOs are active in research worldwide. So we have a mission, let's say. So our mission is obviously to offer the future physicians or medical students an opportunity to experience research, but also diversity for them to grow to grow culturally in countries all over the world. And we are there to provide this network of locally and internationally active students to facilitate the, their access to research exchange and projects. We want to develop both culturally sensitive students and skilled researchers because we want to be there and to shape the future of science. So what we actually do for students, we 
of course, uh, offer them the opportunity to learn about literature studies, to collect data, to do scientific writing, do laboratory work, statistics, and ethical medical aspects. A lot of our students, after their exchange, go on and publish their work in different journals. So we are there to advocate for open access and open science. So because we know that medical students often lack the opportunities to learn about research in medical education, because there are different barriers facing research education in, within the medical curriculum itself. And we want to help to go over these barriers by overcoming, uh, overcoming these barriers through peer-assisted learning. We have collected in 2018 a lot of data that showcase that actually 98% of medical students think that research is important in medical education, but less than 20% of them actually believe that it is sufficiently addressed in their medical curricula. So we have developed these training manuals and educational activities for uh, to assist local, especially local uh, committees in offering these student-led outcome-based workshops that are open, they are free, and they are accessible to anyone that is interested in doing anything regarding medical research. So we also have a lot of programs that focus, as you can see, on teaching medical skills and medical education systems. They do research practice for medical practitioners. They work on open science. And we have a lot of NMOs, so national member organization, who work on this. Uh, this is one of our latest achievements, let's say. We developed a, a basic research competencies framework that is offering the systematic approach to essential competencies that every medical student should have in order to develop the expected skill set in research and basically shape the medicine of tomorrow. We believe this framework will be very beneficial to institutions that are looking to incorporate or to advance research education into their undergraduate medical education. So we are now reaching out to partners that can endorse this basic research competencies framework. We also were uh, heavily, let's say, advocating in Open Access Week. Obviously, it's one of our biggest campaigns, and it also happened as uh, everyone else in the last week of October. We worked on uh, from the history to of open access to its role in health equity. And obviously we held an activities fair because we wanted to showcase our uh, no, national member organizations work. And other than research itself, we also do a lot on uh, external meetings, capacity building, creating opportunities for our members, as I said. Uh, one of our latest external meetings was our attendance to the World Health Summit, which was in Berlin, in Germany in the last week of October also. Our vice president for external affairs participated as a panelist in the launch of the report at the Lancet and Financial Times Commission. We worked on um, inequalities and youth with the, within the COVID pandemic, and we also promoted our competencies framework. We also attended Open Education Conference 2021 with the delegation, uh, which I hope we will also be able to have a delegation to Force uh, 11 next year. Uh, we attended um, many things. We also offer capacity building opportunities for medical students. This is, uh, I'm offering you like the latest, let's say, news and uh, events that we actually uh, took part in. This happened in Portugal between the 1st of September and 5th of September. And we had, uh, there were five workshops happening we, from professional and research exchanges to uh, advocacy and policy making on health, environment and climate change to disaster medicine training. And my favorite, because I, was, I had opportunity to go there as a trainer was the one about health workforce, uh, which was the key of strengthening health systems. And of course, we are working on other opportunities such as the Amy Conference, uh, co-leading co the Amy Student Task Force, uh, preparing for the youth pre-WHA, and so many more. And this is my contact information after this panel, if any of you would like to uh, get in touch. So yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madalena, for the very detailed and informative uh, talk. Our next speaker is Don uh, Presno. And Don, I would like you to introduce yourself. And also, I have two questions for you. So um, I'd like to, to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about uh, GHF. And the two questions is that since you have been working with early careers and students in the past few years, uh, what are what are some of the outcomes that you could achieve by working with with that sector? And also, what advice could you give to other senior researchers or like journal, university, or organization administrations 
uh, and why they should engage, you know, early careers and students in that regards. Thank you very much, Osman, and thank you for the invitation to speak in this uh, conference. Um, I am Don. I'm with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I also uh, with Harvard University. But I think uh, I would like to emphasize here uh, my work with uh, low and middle income countries, particularly with uh, young, budding, emerging researchers. I think uh, this is where I am. Um, I've been working a lot with like uh, Adriana and um, at the BC. And um, we have proven that we can actually make young researchers um, excellent scientists as young as they are publishing with the top journals of the world. And by the way, I am the editor in chief of uh, Public Health Challenges, a uh, journal with Wiley and deputy editor in chief of, um, of BMC Global Health Research and Policy. So I'm trying to emphasize this because I want to show that uh, within the framework of the cycle of research, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm embedded in all parts of it. So I think this is why it became easy for me to uh, communicate and to um, uh, navigate uh, doing the work with low and middle income countries, getting many of these uh, young researchers, because this is where the senior uh, researchers and scientists should be helping in mentoring and guiding uh, these uh, young people. They have all the challenges in the world. I'm very sure of that from just understanding what research is, appreciation of it, to uh, understanding the approaches, methods, the uh, uh, having a, the, a good uh, thinking inquiry of, uh, of, of asking questions. And most of all, what exactly will they be doing with their, with their uh, researches? So at Global Health Focus, which we uh, founded, we just want them because they know better what the situation is in their countries to be able to publish uh, data on the ground and be able to disseminate it to the world so that the paradigm of global health will, will be a two-way conversation with those people from, um, from low and middle income countries, the focus of, uh, of global health. And, and publishing, uh, informing the world, the scientific community, the funders is one of the important aspect. And I think um, this conference and the initiative of, of, of Force 11 will be a major, a good platform for this. So through the example that we have done, it can be successful. Uh, these young people have published um, really so many uh, researches and publications and, and we made it without uh, I mean, even with all these challenges. And so we just don't have to focus on big funders. We can work with, with young people. And eventually, at the end of the day, they will be the future researchers of the world. So while starting them young and being able to understand the whole research cycle would be really very good for research, particularly if we focus on equity, on access, and many other values that researchers and the research community should have. Thank you, Osman. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Uh, our next speaker is Stephanie Hagstrom. Se Stephanie has been uh, part of Force 11 since the beginning. Um, she knows a lot about Force 11 and most of you who attended Force conferences or has worked with um, force working groups in the past definitely know Stephanie. So Stephanie now is part of RDA and I know that RDA has a section uh, of, of early careers um, that work with RDA. So can you tell us more about that, Stephanie? Thank you, Osman. And thank you for organizing the Force 11 conference. And you caught me off guard. <laughs> I'm actually one of the hosts of this event and he recruited me about three minutes ago to talk to you about Research Data Alliance. So thank you very much. So I am the Director of Community Development for the Research Data Alliance US. We have four regions around the world. US is one of them, Australia, EU. And we have 12,000 members working on data uh, issues, you know, challenges around the world. And we do have uh, working groups and interest groups, 97 of them in the organization. And one of them is early careers, um, geared towards early career researchers, young, just coming in, you know, postdoc, pre-postdoc, you know, those kind, and, and uh, graduate students. So um, I, I 
will put the link in the chat. And if you're interested in that, you can take a look at that. Uh, joining RDA is free, but there are others who are in your same situation if you're looking uh, for early career enhancement, um, especially in data research data and open research data and data science. Um, the second thing is that I wanted to bring to the attention of this group is that we do a joint uh, co-data and the RDA do a summer school on data management, fair data um, management. And it's for LMIC countries, people that are involved living in LMIC countries. And I believe it's free. I don't know if there's other people's on this call that could uh, talk about that, but I will also put that link in the chat if anyone's interested in that. And that link will go to the CoData website where they have more information about that and how to sign up. That's all I have. Oh, thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, so I'll speak uh, a little bit my own experience. So um, I've joined the um, like scholarly communication um, like environment early in 2013. Um, you know, I got accidentally introduced to scholarly communications actually. Um, some of you might know this story already. I was at a party late at night and um, I went back to bed at 5 a.m. and I had to wake up at 7 a.m. for a session. And it was part of a, of a student conference. So at 7 a.m., we had an external speaker from Spark and they were speaking about you know, open access, quality communications and all of these things. And I understood nothing basically. And I thought because um, you know, I did not sleep well. So I, I reached out to that speaker and I asked more about um, you know, scholarly communications. And um, like he repeated the entire, uh, the entire talk to me, but still I understood nothing. Um, I went back and asked one of my peers and then she, go, she went back to that speaker and asked them, like Osman didn't understand anything. So he came back to me for the third time and then he was explaining uh, a bit about open access and stuff. And I started to, to learn uh, a little from there. And then afterwards I went online and I was trying to search for some materials, some uh, like beginner materials to learn more about open access, publishing and all of these things. And at the time I remember it was, it was quite hard to understand all of these things. And a few months later, um, I went to the uh, Berlin 11 conference. It was in 2013, it was in Berlin. And then I started to meet more people, engage with more um, students in early careers, learning more about scholarly communications. And over the years, I've been working with, with a number of organizations, you know, doing some advocacy work. Um, I'm originally from Cartoon Sudan, so I've been doing some advocacy work back at home. And one of the very interesting projects that I've, um, I've worked with is that trying to, uh, to engage uh, students at the early level, because uh, we've had so many conversations about changing cultures, changing systems, but I've been telling people that you know, we would not have uh, to, to change the culture if the culture is not already there. So working with, 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 folk, with um, colleagues at an early age, um, getting them to understand publications and then um, basically just teach them about both. You know, there is a paid publication, there is an open access publication. There, these are the pros and cons for each one of them. And then from that, from that early stage, they will be able to choose which one that fits them. And we wouldn't have to go to go back and then like do the change systems and everything. And the second part is that I've been working with some uh, with some developing communities, and in these developing communities, we we do not have that much. Um, level of research awareness. So what we did is that we tried to couple research awareness with scholarly communication um, education, and we were able to succeed with getting almost every publication at a number of universities go open access. Uh, we also had a number of open access policies passed in, in some institutions, and all of that was only um, uh, an effort of students and early careers at that place. Um, in some areas, we get a lot of senior folks, um, you know, concerned mainly about incentives and, and th such things, but um, we usually get the early careers and students uh, who are going to be the future scientists, the future citizens of this place interested in, in learning more and making more impact. Um, I just have one question for Madalena because Madalena is representing the International Federation of Medical Student Associations. It's a massive organization with um, with members from all over the globe. Um, can you tell us, Madalena, uh, some of the achievements that IFMSA could have? Uh, I know that IFMSA had an institutional policy, so this is one thing that if you can talk, talk to us about a little. Yes, of course. So uh, specifically in terms of research, uh, IFMSA obviously has tried to enter this field of open science and um, open access. So we have actually a policy that was adopted adopted in August uh, 2020 on open science. Of course, we uh, have 
this we firmly firmly believe as FMSA in the importance of openness across all published research out, outputs and including of course among others all online research output peer reviewed non peer reviewed journal act articles because we need this in order to bridge the health inequities and advance in health outcomes we affirm through this policy obviously about the pressing need to increase this mobilization of resources and also to the development of systems uh, we also have a policy that works on uh, access to research and is research education that will actually uh, be renewed uh, in March 2020, uh, 2022, this will be next term, so you can also look forward to that. Obviously, uh, to, we also, as I mentioned before, we have a campaign on open access because uh, we are trying to dive more into this field because we need meaningful youth involvement in open access. And we need, uh, because we don't need, instead of allowing technically adults and organizations to tokenize and contribute youth voice, inviting a student to a meeting, we want to be there and talk on be behalf of youth and especially medical students ourselves. Because uh, we are great and we are doing amazing things and we need to acknowledge the diversity of students by validating and authorizing them to represent their own ideas, their own opinions, their own knowledge, and also their own experience. Because not only then can we, um, can we improve our medical schools themselves. Of course, uh, we uh, always, as I said, we have the policies, we have the we have the research campaigns and we are also trying to get into contact with external organizations in order to uh, endorse not only our exchanges because as i mentioned we are one of the we are actually the biggest uh, platform for ex for exchanging medical students worldwide so we are getting uh, we are also obviously uh, have our wonderful partners like force 11 we also cooperate with open education conference we also work with spark but we are also trying to reach out to also regional externals because obviously we have um, different regions that are working strictly on one direction so you should look forward to a lot of let's say events and also regional activities that we would like to promote uh i don't know if i actually answered your question because i i'm very uh, let's say passionate about these subjects so i always tend to go a bit overboard so <laughs> you did madalena thank you very much um uh, we have one question for adrian and yusuf uh what are the challenges of young people particularly for from low income uh, from low and mid income countries in becoming researchers uh, would you like to start, Adriana? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I believe that there are many challenges. Firstly, of course, the awareness towards um, the importance of research itself is a bit limited. Um, and secondly, it's also a challenge that um, um, the training for research itself is not really uh, many in many parts of the LMICs. And um, another challenge is, is that um, in terms of funding, it's also a bit limited, especially for early career researchers and students, uh, because we don't have a name yet, but of course we have to start somewhere. And um, that's what the Global Health Focus, I think, uh, has been very helpful with. Um, because uh, with through Global Health Focus, I and many other students from LMICs got to learn more on how to start uh, and face all these challenges. Um, so the Global Health Focus has been helping with trainings um, on not only how, on how to write the publications, but also on how to disseminate the information and increase the awareness of um, our own faculty and also an extension our government on the importance of also engaging in uh, researcher in early career researchers um, and investing in them because once again as has been said uh, many times in this panel uh, the researchers the early career researchers are the future scientists so um, that's uh, that are the challenge I think. Um, so awareness and also funding and support from our universities. 
Uh, thanks, Adriana. Yusuf, would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, like Adriana said, uh, the awareness level is so low that many young people don't see themselves to be uh, an important stakeholders when it comes to contributing to uh, knowledge. So, but then it looks like um, Global Health Focus is actually trying to solve all this problem before now. We have done a lot to engage young people in research. We now have undergraduate stu students across Africa, Asia, now publishing in top journals. So uh, how are we able to do this? One thing is that we give them that freedom. Uh, we give them that uh, thinking that they can learn on their own. Because the thing is that many of them think that they are not relevant or their role is not so important when it comes to research. So they look down on them and said that, okay, Research is for senior researchers, young people can't do research. But what we do at Global Health Focus is that we make it um, uh, uh, so clear that young people have a clear role to play when it comes to research. And what we can do to actually help them is to contribute to their capacity building. And how do we do this? We just enable them, we give them that uh, enabling environment for them to be able to think to be able to come up with their own topic and we give them guidance and support. So I think I strongly believe that if young people are actually invested in, we give them that uh, uh, opportunity, they can contribute massively to knowledge. For me personally, before I graduated from um, the university as an undergraduate, I published over 50 uh, publications in peer review journals. And this actually also inspired many young people. And now we now have many young graduates, many students from Africa, from Asia now engaging in research. I'm able to do this. I would say one thing that is actually missing is lack of mentorship. But I was able to get that from Professor Don, he's also on this call, he was able to put us through, give us that support. You know, when someone believes in you that you can do this. And that's actually lacking in Africa because when it comes, when it comes to Africa and Asia, they don't see students to be someone relevant in when it comes to research or young people. So Don is able to make it look so glaring with, uh, 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 make it look so easy for us to actually engage in research. And many people are doing fine. So we are able to learn on the job. And when it comes to APC, you know, the problem of paying, uh, the open access fee for journals are so high, but then we also navigate and also come up with strategies to enable students to be able to publish in peer review journals. So I just believe that young people are very crucial when it comes to communicating science, especially from the grassroots and we need to engage them more. And that's what we are doing at Global Health Focus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, so I remember a few years ago, I was at one event like a, um, a scholarly communications event in um, a few of university administrations were actually sharing some of their experiences. And some of them were actually saying that, you know, we had an open access, the International Open Access Week. So they, they had like um, on-campus campaigns and uh, they were trying to attract as many students and early careers as possible, but they were quite frustrated that only two or three people showed up. And I remember um, one of our colleagues were sharing a story that, um, that they had a, a campaign, but nobody actually showed up uh, until they ordered pizza and then they were telling the students that we have pizza there. Um, so sometimes we can say that part of the blame goes back to students and early careers. So uh, my question here to the panelists is, if you're a student or an early career, what do you think um, these? What do you think are the incentives that would bring you to such uh, conversations? And for Don or Stephanie, if you have worked before with early careers and students, uh, what are some of the tactics that you actually use in order to attract students and early careers to your work? I can start with that. We, uh, I was on a project at UCSD. Uh, called DKNet, and it's uh, part of the NIH. So we started with some funding, and that helped <laughs> because we could do a scholarship program in the summer. So we actually gave us uh, out, I don't know, $3,000 or something, a small amount of money. Well, actually, it's a large amount of money for students to come to this FAIR Data five-week intensive training program. And we got, um, and that really helped because Obviously, they're getting a reward for coming, and then they have to work on our project. But the thing that amazed me was we the first year we did it, we had assignments for them, and then at the end we um, did some you know really detailed like how to publish, how to how to participate in scholarly communication at the end. 
And they all said, I wish you had told us this first, like at the beginning, because we're not learning this in our classrooms. We're not learning it in our classrooms. And so we did, we switched the curriculum. But I think what, I, what I've observed over the years, I've been around for quite a while, um, is that we assume this is being taught in the classroom and it's not. It really, you know, there's often it's not. And so I think starting with um, research, you know, the, the research departments at the universities and looking at the curriculum and real world techniques for these students. I mean, I have children in college and they're not learning this. Um, until they're, you know, postdocs, and then they're being thrown into publishing and doing all the work in the lab, and they're not ready, you know, they just haven't learned it yet. So I think looking at some of the curriculums that are going on around um, open publishing, of course, whether your university supports that, um, and looking for opportunities that may not be at the university, but might be in labs within the university, which is where we were. And we had quite a bit of money to give out, but didn't know how to get the word out to the students. So um, I think there probably would have been a lot of the students that are on this call here or even the panel that might have been interested in this. But so there are opportunities like that, and I'm not sure how to tell you to, where to find them, but um, maybe this particular lab was called Fair Data Informatics Lab. So, you know, they might have opportunities like that for students. Yeah, yes, Osman, can I follow? Um, yes, please, Don. So I, we have been um, piloting a number of approaches uh, since we started uh, this initiative. Because uh, the purpose of the original, pur one of the major uh, objectives of the initiative was just to get data on the ground from the developing world, which is central in global health, to be um, disseminated globally so it will influence uh, global health policy and practice. And we noticed that it is more attractive with young people. Now, the thing is, there was, there's only one motivation, which eventually we went through a lot of, of approaches. We started with uh, research trainings, which is the normal paradigm in teaching research, teaching them methodologies, methods, cycles of research, so on and so forth. We notice after lots of trainings in many countries in Africa and Asia, we seem to get only very few publications from every training. So we keep on asking, why is it like that? We notice actually, I think the main motivation why eventually I'm very proud that it just proliferated like after a while, everyone was just writing and publishing is the affirmation that a young person can have one, just one publication in a journal. That's just the major motivation, nothing else. And once you have that spark, they will just disseminate it globally that they are able to do what their professors and top scientists of the world can do. So that, that, that uh, thing that they are able to publish in top journals or even in just uh, credible journals is already the start. And then that's where you come in. So after that, we bring, now bring him to the, to the hardcore of research of the methods, the rigor of ethics and so on and so forth, including grant writing. So once you're able to really bring them into that, Everything else will come, including uh, writing book chapters, which we have been doing, we have done a lot. And then it becomes a big community that everyone is just showing that they can actually do what the professionals can do. So if we provide the young people with this platform that they are able to do it and they, they can affirm that as a young person, as a young student, that they can have many publications later on, then that's when they become very professional. Later on, they will realize that there are more incentives beyond uh, the publication, that they get awards. Like for example, um, Adibisi won the Diana Award, which is an app for his work in advancing research and science in the whole of Africa. They get grants. So many of these young students are already winning grants from 10,000 US dollars to 25,000 US dollars to 60,000 US dollars. We are actually sweeping all the small grants for students. So start with, with the spark of just getting one publication 
and the rest will follow. And 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 we kind of perfected uh, this approach. We changed the we hacked the cycle. We we stopped the research trainings because it takes a long time. So we moved to hands on actual learning, uh, research, and publications. Uh, thank you very much, Don. And does any of our um, Adriana, Yosef, or Madalena would like to add anything to that? I have a quick question, um, Osman. We we can on people from the audience can share their experience too, right? I mean, is that option available here? Yes. And just, I think if anybody wants to, they can raise their hand and I can unmute you if you'd like to get in this conversation as well. Perfect. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Madalena, you wanted to add something? No, it's all right. Thank you. Uh, so, um, you know, one key areas for uh, research communication is scientific writing. And I noticed over time that many students and um, even young people generally actually struggle with uh, scientific writing. I think that's one thing that universities across the world need to actually um, be cognizant about and to take action. Because as a graduate of a university, some of this is struggle on how to write properly. So I think that's one of the areas that we also need to invest in uh, uh, when it comes to students and young people generally. Because that's one of the ways by which you can actually communicate science. You can actually, because many people get just demotivated when they can't write. And the core center of you being able to communicate is you being able to write, especially when it comes to science and uh, scientific uh, publication. So at GHF, though we allow them to write, but we have to keep improving on their work. And a lot of time we have to do that because we really want to help them. So, but with time, we notice that it gets better. So what if they start from the university and the university actually takes it to be one of their core uh, 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 role to improve in scientific writing of their graduates? So is this something that we need to look into? Because we've done that at GHF and many of our, our graduates are not very good writers because we invested, we allow them to write and when they write, we give them honest feedback so that can, they can actually improve on what they do. So one thing that is called to research communication is writing, and we need to invest in that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Uh, we have one question from the audience, but before taking that, I'll just have to, to I'll just have to add this one note. Um, so, so one of the things that we really uh, found uh, helpful is that mentorship. Um, a lot of the programs, a lot of the uh, like workshops, and they, they promise the information, but what you, but many of uh, the students in early careers actually lack is mentorship. So we used to have like an open access campaigns and you have lectures. And in these lectures, we invite um, uh, graduates and undergraduates to um, to learn more about publications and, and how to publish your uh, your research and, and papers, etc. And uh, one year we, we just, you know, took a different path and said that, you know, the participants of this workshop are gonna be mentored. We're gonna walk them through the process of publishing your paper. So we're gonna be you know, working hand in hand with you until you publish that paper. And um, we had hundreds of applications to that one workshop and we have to be highly selective. Uh, but in, in previous years, we usually get like, you know, uh, from 130 to 180, but that, that particular year we had over 700 applications. Um, so, Providing mentorship is, is really important in that area because it, it's what uh, most of those early and, and young folks actually lack. The second thing is about looking for um, looking at the in incentives. Um, students and early careers think about incentives in a different way. So most of the campaigns that actually um, succeeded in engaging that 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 group is. What they did is that they engaged one of the early uh, career professionals or they engaged a student and asked them what are the incentives that would bring you know other students and, and other early careers to the table and looking into these incentives for example if we're working with people who are eager to continue their education then we're talking about you know different publications a number of publications um you know or working on your soft skills etc but this this is a completely different story if you're talking about you know serial researchers um I'll just go ahead and, and uh, uh, the question is uh, from Giordano. I hope I uh, pronounce your name correctly. Are there initiatives anywhere in the global south comparable to the open course where of MIT? 
which could better address local needs and sensitivities. They might lead early students to performing a personal vision on research and follow that path. Uh, I'm personally not aware of the open course where if I might see it, but if any of our panelists here know about it and would like to answer this question, please go ahead. Uh, maybe I can start. There are actually many um, programs, courses available online. Uh, and they are actually accessible in uh, low and middle income countries and the developing world. And normally we use these um, uh, learning tools just to augment, because again, uh, mentorship is very crucial in, in, in the process. And the technologies would be there just to assist. For example, we don't do any more hardcore uh, research methods training because everything is online, softwares, apps, uh, uh, webinars, uh, and, and even just uh, uh, videos on YouTube. And then we just try to identify and share it with them so that we don't keep on repeating uh, the, the, the trainings, which, which can be done by all these software. So we'll also try to make use of tools. But again, there will be a real hands-on mentorship so that uh, the technology and mentorship will work together. Back. Thank you very much, Don. I'll move to the second question. Uh, it's an anonymous question. I feel like there is a bit of a gap between services, services, resources for grad students and postdoc early researchers versus what's available for undergrads. That has always seemed to be uh, seemed a bit uh, attributory to me. Thoughts on why this might be? Does any, does any of our panelists would like to answer this question? Uh, Madalena, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, from a student's perspective, because uh, that's what I'm currently representing, uh, that is indeed somehow the view also of medical students. Uh, we tried to conduct like a global survey in 2018, and this is also what the survey also, let's say, uh, expressed that undergraduate students feel like there is a lack of opportunities to get into research and also that the undergraduate curriculum is not fulfilling their needs to get that knowledge to actually uh, be able to get themselves involved. To be told on my personal opinion, I think uh, this gap exists mostly because as a undergraduate researcher, it is quite hard to publish by yourself, especially if you are not, um, let's say, peered by another, someone that has worked in that domain. But if you want to start by yourself, that is very hard for an undergraduate student. So I think that is also why there is this gap in services and resources. But I also feel that in the past years, not only student organizations, but also medical schools and researchers themselves have tried to bridge this gap by offering the opportunities and capacity building. And uh, as some of our amazing uh, panelists, they also tried to get under their wing young researchers themselves to help them. So I feel like everyone is kind of, uh, let's say, coming together under the understanding that this is a gap that we actually need to bridge and we cannot bridge on our own. And I personally feel like from here, it's only a way up, but also uh, that can only be done together. I, Thank you very um, much, Madalena. I, I have a bit of a experience just from a lab point of view, but by the time someone's a postdoc and they end up in our lab, we're assuming they know how to conduct research at that point. And they are given a lot of the work that's in the lab and that they're expected to join organizations like RDA and Force 11 and be go to these conferences like we're doing now. I'm not saying that's the correct assumption, but I've seen that happen over and over in our in our in the labs that I've worked in. Once you're at that level, uh, you should know how to write a paper and submit for grants and things like that. And so it's the PI's responsibility to help mentor those people. And as we all know, the PIs are very busy people and that rarely happens. So I would certainly support some kind of initiatives for that gap. I think it's a, something that needs to be talked about. And um, I'm glad you brought that, that up, um, the anonymous person, because I do think it's a gap that we assume that by the time they're, they've reached that 
level of early career, they're further along than we, we might imagine. So I think it is something that we should put down is to look at and I'm only coming from my the lab, the few labs that I've been in. I mean, I've been in labs where people have showed up to work and I don't even know who they're working for. It's like, hi, why don't you sit down at that desk over there? <laughs> you know, that, that's reality sometimes, you know, at busy labs. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. that was my input. Uh, since we're very fortunate that we well, have Stephanie Hagstrom here, uh, um, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Lisa. Oh, okay. So uh, another gap that I've, I've actually noticed personally is that the university actually, they need to do a lot. We need to start uh, uh, breeding young people like from their undergraduate days to be active in research or at least to be introducing them to research. But most universities don't see undergraduate to be valuable when it comes to uh, uh, contributing to, uh, to, to knowledge. So they see them to be let them just stay aside. But in the world of today, we need to actively engage young people and faculty members at the university has a very critical role to play in this. It's not just, I think learning in the world of today should not just be didactic, just teach them this, teach them that, and let them pour it for you back in the exam. It should be something that's more innovative and you encourage students to actually do more research and also able to publish before they graduate. It's something that is possible. Young people are doing that. At Global Health Focus, we have many undergraduates that publish significantly in peer review journals. So it's just about getting the right mentorship and engaging them uh, 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 correctly and also celebrating them. That's another thing. Because the more you celebrate these young people, the more others will see them and the people, they will also pick up interest in research. So that could be a form of incentive that, that actually attracts more people to research. Celebrate them as an undergraduate, not just that they are doing one kind of research that, is, that you can celebrate them for. We need to actively engage them now because they are the future. It's not that when they get to postgraduate level, that's where they will start. No, young people can do it from undergraduate level. They can actively be engaged in research and they can do significantly well. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Um, since we have Stephanie Hagstrom here, we're very fortunate to have Stephanie. Uh, I just like to ask this question, which is related to a topic that is quite close to my heart, which is Fisky. Um, so Stephanie has been running Fisky for, uh, Stephanie in collaboration with some universities have been uh, running Fisky for, for, for a few years now. And one of the things that Fisky did is actually uh, train uh, people, including students and like uh, undergrad or postgrad students. So my question here is that what is your, what are your takeaways from Fisky in regards to engaging students and uh, how did that help you to raise funds? Like engaging students and allowing um, offering sponsor uh, scholarships for that group of people in in getting more sponsorship and getting more funds to Fisky. Um, it's an interesting question because it's something we're challenged with every single year. Um, we're having trouble getting sponsorship. So I have conversations with some of the funders, and they they want they might sponsor carpentries, which is you know training the trainer type of um, courses, but so. For those on the call who don't know, Fisky is was started five years ago, and it's the Force 11 Scholarly Communication, and I was one of the founders of that. Marty Brenner's on the call; he's another one, and Osman has been part of Force 11 for a long time. And I knew you when you were early career. Um, I met you when you were early career, and it was a gap like we're discussing here that we saw needed some closing. And so we started this institute at UCSD to address some of the scholarly communication and publishing and open science issues. So we have intensive five-day courses on these. And um, in answer to your question, we haven't found the success in finding funding. Um, UCSD supported it the first two years with a grant to me for that. And then um, uh, we moved it, Marty Brenner helped move it up to UCLA when the grant was finished at UCSD and the UCLA, uh, University of California, Los Angeles Library is now hosting it. Uh, we had an in-person two years ago and we've had it virtually since. Um, it's well received. We get a lot of great feedback. I think it's um, filling a gap like we're discussing here. I don't have an answer for the funding issue. We've had conversations with many funders about helping support this. And um, 
we haven't been able to find that magic, you know, the magic pill to have them say yes. And um, so if anyone has an idea on that, because it definitely is a whole, um, yeah, I don't have an answer. We're not funded. Um, UCLA has been funding it. So. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, do you have any insights on that, Don, working with GIA, GHF? Like, were you able to get some funding in, in that regards to work with early careers and students? Um, we, we do have, are able to penetrate some funding uh, organizations, but it would depend on whether it's thematic, for example. So we have different approaches on, on funding. So either on a certain uh, topic, for example, tobacco harm reduction, and so we, we we try to fit uh, research approaches towards the the funding stream in terms of the topic, or we go for for approaches towards methods. Then that would be another funding stream. We just mix and match funding. We don't uh, we don't yet um, expose the young students to big funding yet because that would be another training. <laughs> Uh, training need for for fund management and research management, but once we're there, I will tell you in another Force Eleven uh, conference. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Um, one personal takeaway from me here is that um, we still face some challenges in working with students in early careers, and we would really love for everyone to actually contribute in in solving such issues. And one of them is actually funding. So we do like funding in that regards, and we do like some training. And as Don has just, you know, um, uh, pointed out in the chat, is that you know resources are not very equ equitable for young researchers globally. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for this very interesting panel, and I'd like to thank you attendees for for joining us for this panel. Uh, thank you very much, and I'd like to hand over to any of our panelists if you'd like to have any final words. But just thanks for including me. It was wonderful having everyone here in the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Uh, thanks, everyone. The next session starts in one minute. You can go to the lobby to join the other session, or you can uh, click on the direct link sent on the Slack Force 2021 channel. Uh, thanks, everyone, and see you at other sessions. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.